for joining us. Um, can the online participants hear us okay? I think so. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming to the new Biodesign C building to participate in this kickoff event. Um, the NRT program is really popular and so this year we wanted to host a kickoff event just to kind of explain the limited submissions process and hear from some panelists who have experience in this area and we think it will be a good overview of what the NRT program does and is and how it can be successful. This year. Um, I'll do some introductions real quick, see if the screen will catch up with me. I'm having a little delay between the Bluetooth keyboard and the um, screen. Um, we've got Troy McDaniel here, he's an assistant research professor in the School of Computing, Informatics, and System, Decision Systems Engineering. Wendy Bernard in Crest, um, Cameron Undreiner in Graduate College, and Marco Janssen in School Sustainability. Um, I have a colleague, Jamie, here from Competitive Intelligence. LJ is our events coordinator, and I'm Haley Bohal. I do the research um, opportunities for limited submissions. So we're within the research development team in Penn. We'll start with Jamie to do the competitive intelligence overview of um, energy report. So I'm going to keep this really brief because I do. There's a um, report that we wrote up here, so I'll just kind of go through it really quickly. But you can you know, feel free to take it and read it. Um, so basically, just background on the NRT program. It seeks to fund um, transformative STEM education models for graduate students. Um, if you know the IGERT program, it's the successor of that program. The difference between IGERT and the NRT is that it added this layer of um, professional development. And so that's something we'll, we'll get into more. Um, previously, the NRT program was in a track with a program called IGE. Um, Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the 
NSF announced in July 2017 that they were going to split these programs. So the first round of awards since the two track split just came out. And so we did this analysis to kind of look at what were the changes um, since the program split. I will share the slides after. Yeah, sorry, we're having a little bit of a in here. It won't progress. I can totally keep talking through it without the slides. Keep talking and I'll talk to you. Yeah. Um, so just kind of some of the key takeaways we found were um, student inclusion. Oh, no, that's two slides from now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we went through the current award, um, and so for 2018, there were 17 NRTs awarded. Ten were in their priority research areas. They do define specific research areas that they're seeking to fund. You can submit outside of those areas. Um, they are kind of favored. Um, and then so far in the whole entire history of the program, there have been 68 funded NRTs and 56 of those have been at unique institutions. That's important for us at ASU because ASU has just awarded an NRT, which is awesome. Um, and so what that showed us was that being awarded an NRT this year will not stop us from getting another one next year. We saw instances where there were consecutive awards, so that's just not a concern moving forward. But not probably two at the same time. Two at the same time? Uh, I believe that actually that is an instance at the University of Maryland, but I can follow up on that and let you know. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the solicitation doesn't mention the number of students you have to have. There's no set number, but what we did was look at the past NRTs to see um, how many are on average included. And so we found that about 65 students are included on average, above that, below that, and that about 26 of those are, are given funding. Um, and then the majority of these NRTs train both master students and doctoral students. Um, we found that there is an emphasis on their priority research areas. Um, and so they outline those areas. You can submit outside of those areas. And if you do, um, we found people were pretty successful when they tried to at least tie back their research to those research areas. Um, the review criteria that we found at least to be kind of the most consistent throughout all these awards was the interdisciplinarity of these um, NRTs. It's, you know, it's something that they really are looking for. And then diversity, um, that's emphasized in a lot of the abstracts. And then, you know, even in the solicitation, it says, they welcome proposals that pair well with NSF and want to include um, you know, STEM students from all different sectors and groups. And then they also emphasize professional development. And with that, we saw different models for emphasizing professional development. Some of it was internships at labs or you know, positions within industry. So there's a lot of different ways that can be done, but just to you know, highlight that focus on the professional development. And then the last thing is, again, our positioning as an institution for fiscal year 2019. Um, I believe there will be, you know, because we were just awarded an NRT in 2018, we don't think that's going to have any impact. So that's all I got. Thank you. Like she said, she has a um, full report that I have copies of, and we can also email it to you if you're interested in the details of it. She's got all her data and statistics available um, and the full analysis. Yeah. Okay. Um, the solicitation, I did bring copies. It's also available online, and I can email copies as well. Um, it's a regular NSF solicitation. And they're going to be hosting a webinar after the limited submissions process here at ASU. The NSF is hosting a webinar. So if you're selected to move forward, there can be an in-depth um, review of your questions from the NSF and from the program officers. So I wanted to put that out here that it's not just um, this is the only information you're getting. You can get a lot more information. And so um, the key dates I have listed here, September 27th is the deadline for the internal process. And so it takes a couple weeks to review and a, and a week to make a decision. And so we give you seven weeks um, before the LOI submission window opens, which is plenty of time to finalize your LOI and get that submitted before December 6th. So really, um, you're really at like 12 weeks before the deadline. It's a good, good lead time. And then the full proposal isn't due until January. I mean, I'm sorry, February, February 6th. Institutional limitations. Um, we are allowed to submit two applications to NSF. That includes if we are serving as a subaward or as a lead proposal. And so um, if you have collaborators that are also submitting, you need to double check the limitability and the institutional qualifications. 
make sure that's tracked correctly. Otherwise, they'll get returned without review, and which is the worst possibility for anything. So we would really like to avoid that if possible. And then, of course, um, personnel limitations. You're allowed to serve on one NRT proposal, which is unique. Not all NSF programs have this type of limitation. Um, the proposal content is detailed in the solicitation. It goes into depth um, on page nine regarding the project description. It requires um, particular things which are different than a regular NSF. So if you're familiar with NSF or not familiar with NRT, they're not necessarily the same content. Um, this program seeks proposals that explore ways for graduate students um, to develop the skills, knowledge, and competencies needed to pursue the STEM careers. So if you're not looking for graduate students or master's degree students, that kind of thing, this is the wrong program for you. This is not, not the right match. Um, it is an up to five year project for $3 million. It's including indirect costs and there's no cost share required or allowed. So it's $3 million is your cap. And they're expecting to give out 10 to 12 awards. Like I said, on page nine of the solicitation, it goes into details regarding the project description. It's 20 pages. It has sections 4A through 4J that are very detailed on what you need to provide and what you should read. Um, what should, you should be focusing on in your product description. It also specifies that there are 10 core participants allowed and that includes your evaluation. So your evaluator is included in that 10 number and they're required to have a bio sketch and a current impending support document as well. So that's a little bit unique. Um, also, I'd like to highlight there's a merit section in the back of the solicitation that is different than regular NSF and that it has more details about what is being reviewed and what the qualifications are for the Okay, the limited submissions process I'm just going to briefly talk about because it's fairly simple. It is a three to five pages summary of your proposal. So I'm not looking for the whole 20 pages. It's a one page budget um, description. I don't need details on how much salary anyone's getting or um, costs of particular items, but it's an estimate. And then a two page CV for each investigator that's involved. Um, we have a new CV guide that's posted on our website and it's linked to where the application is actually at. And this is just to ensure um, equity in our reviewers so that one person doesn't give a two-page CV and one person give a 20-page CV. We'd like them all to be the same so we can just barely look at everyone's qualifications and make sure, yeah. So I have a question on this. Uh, so in, when you say investigator, uh, the uh, NSF uh, document talks about up to 10 people yeah. So these are the 10 investigators or are there principal investigators that uh, or co-principal investigator that you're looking for? Sure. Are you looking for all 10? That's a good question, yeah. If here? you have 10, if you have all of your collaborators and investigators already selected, you're welcome to um, supply all 10 of their CVs. If you don't, you can also comment that and let us know that you have these four people or that's how many people you are going to have. You're not going to have all 10 and let us know. That's perfectly fine as well. How about the evaluator? The evaluator counts as one of those 10. Right. Not, you wouldn't need to know at the point of limited submissions, but you would need to have that information um, for the whole proposal. Right. Um, we can talk more about the evaluation stage. We've got an evaluator here with us today, and so she can give us a little more detail about what's available and that kind of thing. Um, there are a few different services ASU has for that. And then, so just the summary, the CVs and the one-page estimate that's uploaded in a PDF document to a submission portal that is um, very simple. And your research advancement staff in your unit um, should all be familiar with it. I've worked with them for a number of years. And so if they're, if they're not familiar with it, they'll give me a call and I can help them with it. But this is the system. It's called InfoReady. Um, it's linked through the funding site and through uh, the regular URL for it. You can find it no matter where you're at. If you're not able to log in with your ASU information, it's available publicly as well. So um, this is what it looks like. You just hit the apply button, you're asked to upload your PDF document, it sends it to me, then I accept it and you get a confirmation email from us. 
fairly, fairly simple and smooth. And we just ask that you address the program requirements that are in the solicitation because the limited submission reviewers read the solicitation and review your proposal just like the NSF would um, at their review stage. And of course, address the review criteria as well. That's all available to you. So the steps would be just to apply through the InfoReady site and then you're evaluated with a faculty panel using the sponsor guidelines and the review criteria and then you'll be approved to submit at the last stage there. Before we get to the panel, do you, does anyone have any questions? Um, so uh, I'm just curious how, as part of the program requirements, there's the evaluation, there might be external partners that you might want to work with. But at this early stage, that a lot of that isn't going to be nailed down. Is that still right. going to be part of like if that's already completed, that would be a merit to the internal submission? Yeah, so you want to provide the internal submission with as much information as possible. Um, and that's why we welcome as many CVs as you have available. Go ahead and submit them all. Um, but you are limited to three to five pages in your summary, just to keep the review concise. But um, if you have things confirmed, go ahead and mention that. If you don't have them confirmed, but you're working on them, you can mention that as well. It's really what you want to present to the panel. Okay. And so it's Whatever you give them is what they're reviewing. I would include all the information possible to show your program in its best light. Does that kind of answer that question? Okay. Um, I have the panel here. And if, if possible, I'd like you all to introduce yourselves because I just went through your names. I didn't really go into your expertise or your specialties. You would just go ahead and go down the line. We'll start with Trey. And we'll go down and just go ahead and introduce yourself and um, say what you're going to talk about maybe in the summer. Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Troy McDaniel. Uh, I'm an assistant research professor in SITSI. My background is computer science. Um, I started out working in machine learning, computer vision. Uh, nowadays I work in human-computer interaction and my specialty is uh, a field called haptics. So I study the science of touch and technology, which has a lot of applications from everything from tactile displays to robotics, but I still dabble a little bit in machine learning. Um, more recently, three years ago, got involved with smart cities. And so we've been working with Intel the past three years to turn Sun Devil Stadium into a smart stadium to build a sort of test bed. And we just wrapped up an IGERT that was on person-centered accessible technologies. So we worked with a lot of individuals who have disabilities to build assistive technologies. So that just wrapped up. And so we wanted to kind of have a continuation um, where we had a training program in place. And so we were just awarded an NRT, start date September 1st. So our IGER finished up end of July, the NRT started September. And that is on, our NRT is on the topic of smart cities. So citizen-centered smart cities, I'll talk about a little bit more about that later on once we get to my part. And I'll share with you some feedback that we got as part of the review process and, and kind of what we had in our proposal. Hi, I'm Wendy Barner. Um, I am with CREST, College Research Evaluation Service Team. Um, we've been part of ASU for just over seven years, close to eight years. Um, we work throughout the university with different departments as an internal and sometimes an external evaluator, um, working on USAID grants, U.S. Department of Ed, um, National Science Foundation, as well as we have quite a few community grants um, in the Valley. Um, one of the things that um, I will talk about, I think you said was a very good point, and I'll talk about how much evaluation do you need in that three page, which is going to be really little. Um, but also to understand what evaluation, how it can work internally and to save you some money in the budget. And then also to have someone external as a requirement, how it can be situated so that um, you're showing that you have something in place to continuously monitor um, at multiple levels. Hi, I'm Tamara Underreiner. I'm an associate dean in the graduate college. We've been functioning for 80 years this year at ASU. In some graduate colleges and other universities, um, the graduate college is situated within research. At ASU, it's situated in the provost area of campus. But my former position with 
uh, before joining the graduate college was as a research team. And I see some real opportunities here for uh, the, us to work together. So what I'm going to be talking about today are a suite of services that the graduate college offers that hits those three things, interdisciplinarity, diversity, and professional development that you could um, add as distinct, distinguishing factors in your proposal. Well, I'm Mark Yance. I'm a professor in school sustainability. Uh, my background is in applied mathematics. I have been working on all the human environmental systems, behavioral uh, research, decision making, in sustainability related areas. I became on the panel because I was uh, on the review panel at NSF uh, two years ago and last year on the panel panel. And that was uh, two years ago, NSF was being focused program. Great, thank you. Um, Trey, I'm going to start with you. And um, I know you have some really recently awarded experience. So you would describe that in the NRT award and um, include maybe what you um, had as your program goals and the number of students, that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. So our proposal title is uh, citizen-centered smart cities and smart living now when we had submitted our proposal um, we didn't uh, they so they have uh, specific priority areas um, that you can connect your proposal with we picked the other category because we you know smart cities is a very broad topic it's, our project is very interdisciplinary in the sense that we have a lot of different faculty involved including faculty from the social sciences so we didn't want to um, restricted in any way. So we picked the other category. So having said that, even if you do decide that, okay, maybe it doesn't fit here, maybe it's more broad, um, we were funded when we, when we went that route. Um, in terms of the goals, uh, one of our goals um, uh, is, of course, the recruitment, mentoring, and retention um, graduate students. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, from diverse backgrounds, right? So uh, women, uh, underrepresented minorities, uh, and individuals with disabilities uh, in STEM fields. So that, that's very important to have. Um, so we, we were actually trying to get this NRT for the last over two years. So we did submit, and it wasn't accepted. We got feedback, and we accepted again. Uh, we submitted again, and we accepted that uh, second time, second try. So some of the feedback we got, on that uh, first try, we only uh, had in there doctoral students, and uh, some feedback we got was, why aren't master's students involved? And so on our second try, we did put master's and PhD students in there. Um, one thing that's very important, though, is they do, the, the experience should be the same. Okay, they want the same experience given to students, regardless if they're master's, if they're PhD, regardless if they're funded or non-funded. NSF wants the same experience available to all students. So if you're offering different experiences, I wouldn't say, okay, this is only available to those who are funded or this is only available to PhD students. It should be equal across. The other thing is you need to think about what experiences you wanna to provide to students. So for example, are you providing um, uh, uh, like internships, or you provide you know, opportunities for internships with external partners. Are you providing um, uh, cross-disciplinary courses, uh, communication skills training? Whatever experiences you provide, um, make sure you talk about why it's important and why you have it in there. Think about the impact your project will have. For example, um, is that impact through dissemination of research findings? Is it through other elements of your project? So these could be. Uh, uh, some of the goals of your project. These are some of the goals of our project. So in terms of number of students, our first try, we had, um, let's see, I think we had about 24 students total. That includes funded and non-funded. And the feedback we got back was, that's a really low number. This isn't going to have a whole lot of impact. And we had um, uh, a discussion with the program officer, and she said, um, I'd like to see around at least 40 students, okay? 
And our proposal total numbers 38, we were pretty close to 40. So I think as long as you hit that mark 40 or above, you might be fine. Um, in terms of the breakdown of that 38 we have, we had 24 funded and 14 non-funded. So when you start putting together your budget, you may see that, well, how can I get that number of students? Um, you know, it's expensive to, to support students with stipends. So what I recommend you do is match the support one-to-one -one with TAs, okay? That's not cost sharing and um, you can't have TA support built into your proposal. Um, so for example, how we set it up, student comes in, they are gonna be funded two years on stipend, two years on TA support, okay? Now, of course, the TA, that, that TA commitment is gonna come from the individual units involved. So you may wanna start those conversations sooner rather than later. Of course, in your budget, the budget justification, don't put actual dollar amounts down because then it's considered, you know, when you talk about TAs and you start putting dollar amounts down, if that's considered cost sharing. As long as you keep it kind of high level, it should be fine. Um, in terms of the Sorry, limit. Can you talk more about an unfunded? Yes. So, so NSF wants to see um, non-funded students involved. So they want to see funded students as well as non-funded. So what does that mean? So to really maximize the impact, you can bring in non-funded students. So these are going to be students that might be supported in other ways. So for example, um, it could be a student who is supported through an RA through some different sponsored projects, but wants all the experiences. They want to go through the, the NRT program that you built. They want the, those, that experience will enrich. Okay, so um, they're not getting a stipend from the NRT program, they're getting a stipend from Department of Energy or DOT. Or exactly. Like that, and they're doing so come to the communication shop. Exactly. So one example would be like with the IGER we just wrapped up. We had a student come in. She had a NSF graduate research fellowship. And she's like, but I like the topic of the IGER you're doing and I want to go through the program. Hey, that's fine. We'll bring you in as a non-funded student and you're funded through this graduate research fellowship. That's fine. So likewise with the NRT, you, you want to have that. Yep. I have another question. Uh, how does the money come out here? Is the uh, stipend uh, subject to overhead? So I can clarify that in an email after. There are some guidelines in the solicitation about participant support, and we can work with your department to get the policies um, for your specific question. But there are participant support costs allowable, which would not have overhead charged them typically. We can get an exact answer for you. So well, maybe simple, not. The simple answer is yes or no on the stipend. It depends on how the stipend works, but participant support cost does not have overhead charge to it typically. So you can call the stipend participant support. It is required that we call trainee support as participant costs in the budget. Okay. Right. No overhead is the answer. On those on, specific on items. Yes. Yeah. I didn't want to change the um, What if just for having master's students? Do they want to see a balance or could you just have? Um, I think if you decide to go that route, justify it well, because in our proposal, first try, we just had PhD, and we didn't even mention master's students. So the feedback we got was, why aren't master's students involved? So I think it just left a question in reviewers' heads, like, okay, but why aren't you including master's? So if your project, like, if it makes sense to only include master's students and not PhD students, then justify that well, and I think it might be fine. Historically, there has been one NRT only had master's students. So I think it does take that clarification. Another question? Yeah. Um, is it expected that even the non-funded students will do the entire experience that the funded students do? Um, you might have some coursework and you might want to make that available to students who aren't getting funded through the NRT, but might want to take two courses instead of do a four-year program. Mm -hmm. Is that seen as a benefit or a bad thing? So how we approached it in our project was that if they're considered an NRT trainee, funded or not funded, they go through everything. So they do all the courses as well. Okay. Yep. So it's an all or nothing thing. Well, from NSS perspective, I mean, I, I, 
is that a deal breaker for them? Maybe not. I think if you justify it well, maybe that's fine if you make it optional. Um, how we approach it from our side, if they're training, they go through everything. You know, yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, the 40 students would be a combination of students that are already at the university at some stage of their graduate education, plus those that you're planning to recruit once the NRT. So it could be a combination of students already at the university or, or not. So um, it could be students who are, uh, so when you put together this project, you'll have a formal application process, or at least you should, NSF likes to see that, right? So you'll have a website, students can apply, those students can be, you know, from all over the place. Um, of course, to receive NSF funding, they do have to be US citizens or permanent residents. So the non-funded route is a good way to bring in international students. Because they couldn't receive. Yeah. Okay. So I know. So I know my time's almost up. So I'm going to run through these other points really quickly. Okay. Um, so limited submission in terms of the feedback it was a useful process for us. I'll give you some feedback we received that was helpful. Number one is. They want to see whatever team you put together is cohesive and makes sense. I wouldn't just kind of recruit faculty um, without kind of thinking through the project, uh, the, the project team you want to build and the expertise you need for that. Um, the other thing is the communication skills training is very important. Make sure you think through that carefully. They want to see science communication and and broad communication and communicating with specific stakeholders. So training um, should cover a lot of those. Um, the evaluation, of course, is very important. So for one feedback we got during limited submission was, wasn't clear um, how, um, uh, you know, what, what the contingency plans were. So if we're doing the assessment and we see that goals are at risk of not being met, what are we going to do? Um, so in our assessment, we had um, you know, our outcomes, a list of outcomes, each with um, how we're going to measure that outcome, and then a contingency plan for each. One very important thing to remember is for your performance assessment, you need both, you need both uh, quantitative measures as well as qualitative. So it should be both quantitative and qualitative. Um, and then the other thing is leveraging uh, other NSF supported projects like NSF Includes. So for our project, uh, we leveraged uh, ASU's NSF Includes. So Kyle Squires is the PI for that. So if you reach out to Kyle and kind of talk about what you want to do, he might be willing um, to work with you. Um, in terms of strong points, our strong point was the research theme. Make sure whatever research theme you select is well justified, and then the team we selected. Um, Weak points, I think I already mentioned some of the feedback we got here. So um, very quickly, just three more things I want to mention. So we love, so they want to see evidence-based strategies employed, especially for recruitment. So one thing that we did that we actually got pretty good feedback on was that we leveraged um, ASU's graduate college uh, best practices for recruitment. So if you Google ASU Graduate College Best Practices, um, you'll be able to find some of their best practices for recruiting and, re and, and retaining students. Um, start teaming now. Start building your team um, earlier rather than later. And start thinking about your project evaluator. Um, that's important to get a project evaluator on um, early. Okay. And then project assessment, don't, um, I, we had at least two pages in our proposal for project assessment. It's so important. Don't just put in a short paragraph. You need a lot of details there. Um, and then for your core team, um, so we had, of course, you need 10, 10 members of your core team. For us, we had our PI, um, four co-PIs, four faculty participants, and then our evaluator. But you can augment your core team. For example, for us, we had what we called other faculty participants. So we were actually to, able to expand the team by about four or six more people, this other faculty participant category to get in more expertise. Um, and then lastly, the organization. 
think about how everyone's going to work together um, and what makes sense there. So this is a large project, right? So think about how you might be able to um, create different subcommittees involving different faculty involved in your core team and what are their, those responsibilities. So think about that overall organization and how that's going to work together. Um, okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, really summarized your recent award quickly. Um, I'm sure there's lots more details that could be expanded upon, um, but we appreciate you kind of giving us the overview. Um, Wendy, would you um, give us some information for the evaluation and maybe in particular, um, why evaluation is important in preparing a proposal generally, not just for the NRT, and um, I'll just kind of let you go for it there. Okay, so program evaluation is sometimes um, sometimes forgotten until the end, but I think it is really important as you're thinking through your project. The program evaluation can be a piece that helps you tell your story. So as you're thinking about your outcomes, as you're thinking about who you're recruiting, you have an evaluator there from those, the beginning of those discussions. They can start thinking about how is that measured? How is it aligned to the activities? Um, and exactly what you're saying, what do you do if you don't see that impact? Um, so the evaluation is really important and um, you know, leverage it, allow pages. I know pages, it gets, you know, they're, they're precious as you're putting together these proposals. But sometimes your evaluation plan can add in a chart that really starts to tell your story. Okay, you're trying to recruit this many people. You've only recruited this many. What do you do? You haven't met your target. The evaluation is what then says, you haven't met your target, not the end of the world. You have to go back, figure out why you haven't met your target, you know, whether it's exit interviews, whether it's reviewing your recruitment strategy, whether it's looking at faculty, whatever it is shows on a staff that you've you've created a feedback loop to come up and make your program the best that it can be um, so that's really the way you know start approach your evaluator in, in that regard we're there to help your program succeed to be someone objective that comes in that can look at those pieces um, and try to make those connections for you um, so that's why again it gives accountability to the program it says the dollars are being well spent and it allows for modifications um, throughout the life of the program. And NSF, um, like I said, we were the evaluators on quite a few NSF grants. Um, and at all the site reviews, NSF um, visit, they're always very appreciative of the evaluation team coming in and saying, these are the outcomes that we've seen. Uh, this is where they really hit the mark. This is where we have some work to do. And this is how we're working with the team to make some changes so that they can hit the mark moving forward. Um, again, that's always very well received. Um, for, I wanna to touch on the internal submission. Um, again, you're very limited space. You really wanna focus on the technical aspects um, of what you're planning to do um, to get through this limited submission process. Um, doesn't mean you don't say that you're, you will have an evaluator who will conduct a rigorous evaluation and importantly, that you'll put funds aside for it. Um, there are ways that um, internally, there's a couple groups on campus that do evaluations, um, and also in the community. There's ways to save money. If you only have so much money, be honest with the evaluation team. Say, this is what we have, and we'll come up with a plan that still shows that there's a comprehensive plan in place, um, because if there's not, or if there's not enough money associated with it, that can be dinged. That's happened before where we've put together this beautiful evaluation plan, um, and then unbeknownst to us, the budget has was decreased before it was submitted, and then that comes back saying that there wasn't enough money to support the evaluation design, and that is the last thing you want. So just be honest with the evaluation team, what your budget is, um, and the evaluation team will come up with a plan um, for you to be as rigorous as we possibly can based on that budget. Wendy, can I ask what API can expect um, from to budget for this kind of evaluation? What's a general guideline that they can expect? It, it, that, it might not be a number. It really, it really depends. For some of our smaller grants, a lot of times it's tracking students and that they can be very small. And we have some grants that um, very small, uh, but it really depends on what what you're looking for. I would I would say you really want 
four to five percent um, as the evaluation budget. And I think that's really fair. And what happens is that evaluation budget can shift. You know, you have, and you're, I'm sure you all know, um, in your funding, there's, there's room for you to shift throughout the year. So if things are not working right, or you need to add an evaluation component because of something that happened, you want a little bit of flexibility in that budget. Um, lucky for you all, the way ASU's evaluation teams are set up, it's just personnel costs. So if we think it's going to take us, you know, 80 hours to get this entire evaluation done, complete and report written, that's what we charge. We don't charge, um, a cost. we're not a cost plus model. I would love to be a cost plus model, but we're here to help you. So uh, those costs are not uniformly over the lifetime of the grant, right? Yeah, so and they, and they can definitely say shift. you have a midterm and an end or, or yes. something like that? Very good point. So again, depending on how the grant is set up, let's say your first year is a planning year and you're really putting the pieces into place, you're thinking about recruitment, you need the evaluator to do document review, you need the evaluator to look at your plan um, and to participate in some of your meetings. That's a very limited cost. As, as you get more participants, and as you move through the life of the grant, you will have more data to collect, both quantitative and qualitative, and that is critical. NSF loves to hear stories about the participants, um, rightfully so. You know, it's nice to be able to, to you know, do some case studies in the report. Um, and then sometimes the final year is the largest amount because it's really pulling together all of these data points to tell the overall the overall story. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's just easier to say this is how much overall it will cost and we can negotiate um, how that works over the lifespan of the grant three or five years. Um, but very good question. And then one other piece I've alluded to, um, but I want to make explicit, NSF requires a formative evaluation as well as an impact evaluation. And that formative piece is, what I've, I've spoken about a little bit, what you're doing and what's working. Um, if you, again, I'm gonna go back to recruitment. If you're recruiting and your goal is to have a diverse population, and that after the first year, you have a group that is not diverse, the evaluator can help you collect data, can help work with you to come up with how do you mitigate that? How do you then recruit to other groups? How do you tell NSF that we did not, we missed the mark? The evaluation team did a document review. Um, now our grant has decided that our application process will be different, or we will recruit at different conferences or whatever it is. Um, but the evaluation piece should really tell the story of you meet on a regular basis and there's feedback constantly um, between the evaluator and the program. Um, and then the impact evaluation, again, quantitative and qualitative data, really mixed methodology to tell the story of where you are um, and where you want to go. Um, and sometimes you get results that aren't what you expected. And it's unfortunate. And I programs sometimes take it very personally when it looks like student knowledge didn't increase or motivation or interest in a career. But what it's meant is to help you change course then of your program. You know, we can work with students and say, well, what was it? You know, what did you need? What didn't you need? And as long as you show NSF that you're willing to make changes in the next go around of the grant, it's not seen as a negative. It's definitely seen as a threat, but you can change it into an opportunity um, in your whole SWOT analysis. So I'll stop it there, but obviously we'll take questions at the end. Question. Yeah. Uh, is it is Crestview is a recharge center in the university? Do you send like monthly bills? No, or so we're not. Billing yeah, so we're not a recharge center. We just um, work with the business manager and set aside personnel costs. So it would be someone on my team is paid, you know, two percent out of the grant throughout the year. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Wendy. Um, can we provide your contact information to? Yes, and I have, and I also have business. Cards, oh, perfect. Okay. And I'm happy to help. And as a professional courtesy, please reach out to me. Um, we we help write grants free. We help write the evaluation evaluation section free of charge. No, that's hard to believe, but we want to help you. <laughs> um, and the expectation is that you get the grant that you hire us as your evaluator. But as a professional courtesy, we are more than happy to sit down with you and go through ideas and think about evaluation. Um, so please contact me and you know, I'd be happy 
to get on my soapbox and tell you how great evaluation is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tamara, we'll move on to you. Um, could you describe some of the resources the graduate college can provide to interested applicants? And then also, um, Marco, um, Troy had mentioned the best practices of the graduate mm -hmm. college. Could you elaborate on that too? So we, um, we produce a series of best practices guides to help units do their job better um, based on our research on graduate education generally. For example, uh, this weekend, if the hurricane doesn't prevent me from getting there, I'll be in Washington, D.C. for the Council of Grad Schools uh, for a big colloquium on how admissions criteria uh, track with master's degree retention. Success. We, we're constantly researching the kinds of higher optic um, trends and so forth to help each unit uh, do, do the best that they can. And Troy, I really appreciate the plugs for our best practices <laughs> regarding recruitment. Um, as, that, that, that's a four page document that's evidence based how to get the best students possible. So we have a, a bunch of different uh, best practices ranging from how to develop a student handbook to um, how to love a postdoc in your life. <laughs> that's a, a variety of things. Um, for the purposes of these kinds of grants, I put together a brief synopsis and um, I made a stack of these available if you want to pick one up. Because after they're recruited, we really try our best to take care of them once they're here with us. You can talk about these things, and all it will cost you really is the space in your proposal, because we're not a charge center of any sort. Everything that we do is made freely available, you, including help writing the narrative at the beginning. So um, we're interested in uh, professional development very broadly construed, uh, and that includes helping people think interdisciplinarily, uh, helping them with those broad cross-cutting skills that no matter what their careers are, they'll need like communication, uh, playing and collaboration and critical thinking. Uh, we also have, um, and so anyway, we offer a series of workshops uh, every month we're doing something that supports that. But there are also formal programs, and this, this describes those more formal programs that can um, be structured into your training program. And those include our first year success seminar called the Interdisciplinary Research Colloquium that is specifically targeted to diverse interdisciplinary together. It's for first year, first generation graduate students, not exclusively, but that's what it's designed for, to help them get the ropes of graduate school under their belt and then collaborate with someone on an interdisciplinary research project as part of the outputs of that particular class. We have a Preparing Future Faculty and Scholars seminar, meets weekly, uh, once a year, uh, preparing students to think about what they'll do with their advanced degree. Their, in academia or outside in your government careers. Uh, we have a, what we, the, a pretty new initiative called Knowledge Mobilization, and that's a studio that really ties well into the parallel initiative of the NSF and some other funding agencies to pay attention to broader impacts. So we're teaching students how to think about how they can walk their research into the world uh, for multiple audiences. And then we also have mentoring networks that are set up specifically oriented toward diverse populations who may not be to the manner of graduate school. So the, those uh, mentoring initiatives are described also in the sheet. So if there's any um, space left in your proposal to consider us your partners in, in training your students, consider it. Uh, our recognition comes from a different source, so the money is all yours. So we just would love to help make ASU distinguished in this uh, space. And we think the grad college could be considered a distinguisher in the proposals. Yeah.
Um, again, I'll share your contact information. And if you could send me an electronic copy of that, I'll share it with people who are online. If not, I can PDF it or whatnot. It doesn't matter. Um, Marco, you described that you were on a review panel a few years ago for NSF. Um, would you describe some of the high-level attributes you saw in those proposals? Maybe some negatives and some positives of each? Just kind of a general overview? Yeah, so this was uh, for the first program, which is food and water. Uh, about 30 proposals in that panel. Uh, it was extremely comparative. Uh, I think in the end, from proposals I reviewed, one class panel. So there were more than one way of proposals. Um, so what were really interesting good proposals? Uh, so some aspects that uh, stood out is that it creates an uh, ecosystem of activities. And so there are a lot of activities. Uh, it's not all or nothing, as, uh, as as you indicated. There's a lot of people who are also not part of not official. Uh, scholars from that program may also participate and have interactions with people outside universities. So there are a lot of things going on. And you see that it's not a ten um uh, few uh, proposed uh, uh, research projects that are great because that will be uh, one of the dangers that okay we have a list of five interesting Projects and then uh, after two years, we find out that two may actually not be successful. So, you want to create a lot of activities that also students can do this internship, create their own uh, projects. Uh, so, that's uh, interesting proposals where they have a lot of interaction with uh, outside the university with internships and students put within the broader context of the proposal. Brought their own. And I also posted an element that I found when it comes to evaluation, uh, because you have as we do have, you see all this uh, the uh, program evaluation was most of the famous thing, but very few actually talk about what to do if uh, if they get outcomes of the evaluation. So uh, think about what to do. It's not just an afterthought that you have to evaluate, that you hire someone who's doing an evaluation. This are some consequences, and it's part of the whole project. Uh, so um, some aspects that were that were uh, not that um, uh, positive that I noticed, uh, which uh, makes some to some positive, but so. Uh, if you had uh, focusing too uh, too much on the students in your program, that way you become an extended extension of your lab, and, and that that it's not that you create a product well, it's, it's not in a sense not that the money is well spent, not just to the to students to get scholarships and the token social scientists. So uh, that it's focused on STEM research, but you also want to be interdisciplinary. So uh, most of us talk about social science, and then there is no social scientist uh, involved in the in the list. Of faculty or there is um, um, somebody, but you seem not to have the really credentials to doesn't doesn't uh, have the um, yeah, the status as the SDL. So if you want to include social science in your research because you want to be interested, I take that also seriously. Uh, so I had a number of proposals that it was very much from one, looked at almost as it was from one department uh, at different branches. So what is interdisciplinary is always a challenge, but especially if they talk about social science, I remember proposals that they had not even any social science. As somebody with social science training, I don't have formal social science training either. At least I promise it's social science. So you have to be made the case that you are doing social science. If you're, uh, and so, because there are actually a lot of social scientists are in the review panels and they don't uh, appreciate uh, that part and they see the holes of your social science component. Uh, if you want to think that that's uh, part. So, what I think NSF want to see is that they get uh, uh, good scalable uh, proposals. 
What I mean by that is they, uh, it's also risk management because it's uh, $2 million is uh, uh, a lot of funds. So how do you deal with, uh, do you give, uh, if you give scholarships to so many years to students, uh, that can, not, not all students work out fine, but all projects work out fine. So uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, we could have internal competitions for uh, these fellowship programs too. Um, and, um, and that it is, uh, there is a broader impact. So uh, maybe you create educational material, uh, create a MOOC or something that is beyond uh, your, your particular group. Um, I think that's yeah, professional training. Also, a lot of standard work there. But what NSF, what I think NSF wants is that, I, I probably all know, is that a lot of PhDs, uh, people get a PhD, don't stay in academia, but we train people as if they become clones of us. That's not really the right thing to do uh, in for, for the long term. So we should. Also think that maybe we should, we are not the best people to train people and not become the cause of us. So think about what will be your professional training. So uh, maybe uh, the faculty might not always be the, uh, the, the best people to do this professional training. <laughs> Thank you. Um, your interpretation of what NSF was looking for was, was good. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to kind of define what you were able to review a few years ago. Um, does anyone have any questions for the panelists? We've got just a few minutes left. Yeah, please. How, uh, so one way to do this is to say, I want to launch a new PhD program or a new uh, graduate program of one thing or another. Is that seen as a benefit if you have a new uh, PhD that you're granting? Or can it be more open-ended like at ASU we have graduate certificates? So it might be something like aligning graduate certificates across schools around an interdisciplinary subject. If you want to do a new uh, program, then uh, I've seen those proposals. So one risk there is to build this be approved to find that you get money. So, uh, uh, so you have to make a clear world, make a case that this is actually going to happen. And it will be uh, sufficient to see a program. So, uh, so there is this uh, this that way of doing that. So uh, typically they say that uh, you have students from multiple programs uh, involved, and so that might be a way to to deal with some risk management. Because I think a lot of that is also to try to avoid that they spend the million dollars on the wrong place. A question for me. So. Uh, where did the money go otherwise? So, so far I hear uh, stipends for students. I hear evaluator. What other categories do I have? Yeah, so another category will be travel. So NSF wants the PI to attend an orientation meeting the first year, but also the PI project coordinator and one trainee to attend an annual NRT meeting each year of the project. So you'll have some travel for that. You'll also put some travel support in for the students, but that'll be within participant support costs. Another category could be some salary support for uh, faculty, uh, because obviously they're gonna be involved in many different parts of this project. So if there's room in the budget, you may wanna put some so how much of that, yeah, so that, that is obviously a sort of a can of worms there, so how, how much of that? Um, a very, very small amount because, you know, to, to get enough support in the, in, the, in the budget toward these stipends, get that number of students, that ballpark number we wanted to get to, that takes up the majority of the budget. Now, having said that, that was actually a positive comment we got. That reviewers like the fact that, hey, most of the money is going towards students. So that was actually a positive thing. Yeah. Did you have any money for uh, administrators to program in some way? 
Oh, yes. I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot to mention our project coordinator. So NSF, um, I, I think that, um, you know, from NSF side, this is uh, a, a huge project to manage, right? So I think it's important to have a project coordinator in there who is going to help um, uh, with, with um, kind of running. So that's a staff or a faculty? Um, well, I think uh, either way is fine. So for our IGER, for example, we hired a faculty member, but now for our NRT, uh, we're going to hire a staff member. There are some specific guidelines on that um, on page 11 that you can clarify. It doesn't specifically mention faculty or staff, but it does have other two. I'll take one more question just because I don't want to go over the timeline. So, um, so when you say stipends, it um, also twitch. Wait, uh, so I haven't um, fully parsed out the budget restrictions, and I suggest that you do that with your research advancement staff, because your department might have different policies than everyone else's. You know, I don't know exactly what your department does for tuition remission, and so I would advise you to talk to your research advancement staff to do that. Um, but it does have guidelines for tuition and trainee support listed here, and your staff will be able to better analyze that for you. Um, unless someone wants to address that. Okay. Um, we are right at the time, so I'm going to say thank you. I appreciate you guys for coming out and doing this for us. Um, and I hope that we can give everyone a little bit of insight into the ART program. If you have any other questions, I'm going to provide contact information and so um, and prior to the email. If you have any further questions, you can feel free to email us. Does that work? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you stop recording. Go ahead and stop recording.